we've set up a simple way for you to give to our church online. If you want to give a quick gift, enter an amount, select a fund, and enter your email address. Then enter your payment details and click Give. And that's it. We'll send a receipt to your email address. To use a saved payment method or manage a recurring donation, you'll want to log in. Click the Login button and we'll send a code to your phone or email account. Verify the code and you're in. Now your payment info is ready to go when you want to make a donation. And if you switch over to the My Profile page, you can update your contact info, link to a bank account, and review your giving history. To get started, visit our website or download the Church Center app in your Android or Apple App Store.
Good morning, Cross Connection. You can be seated. It's good to see everybody today. Are you excited today? Amen. Amen. Um, we didn't have the ushers come. I'll tell you, if you've been listening to the news, things are getting exciting, aren't they? I mean, whew. do you think we'll finish the service today? May not. Who knows? Only God. <laughs> Even so, come quickly, right? You know, the, the Bible says, pray for one another, thus fulfilling the law of righteousness. Um, during these trying times, let's pray for one another. Let's pray for those in, that are in our elected officials and pray for those here in the body of believers. And uh, just get on our knees and our face before God. And uh, you know what? He's never let me down. Never let me down. Whatever happens, I know one thing. He's in control. Amen? Amen. All right. We just have a few announcements. Uh, we're in need of offerings for our benevolence fund, which provides financial assistance to church members in need. And if you want to give, you could submit through our giving envelopes and label it benevolence. Contact the church office or scan the code in your bulletin and select benevolence in the drop down to donate online. Our women's ministries will hope, host a game night on Friday, April 19th, and that's at 7. If you have any questions, uh, please see Stella Ashworth. Then join us on Sunday, April 21st, for our monthly communion. That's always a great time, isn't it? Just to be able to partake in the body and blood of Christ. Um, our monthly fasting week is April 22nd through the 28th. This will be a time stealer fast where we're abstaining from certain things that rob us of our time with God. Our focus this month will be in direction from God based on Acts 9-9. And ladies, you cannot get rid of your husband for a week. That doesn't count. Okay. Uh, if you're interested in joining the guys for a men's fishing trip April 19th and 20, uh, sign up at the info booth. Uh, this will be a fishing trip in North Carolina. Youth camp is scheduled for July 1st through 5th, and the cost per student is 214 A deposit of $100 is due by Sunday, if, uh, Sunday, May 5th. If you would like to sponsor a student for youth camp, please see Pastor Mike. Even if you can't do the full amount, all amounts are appreciated. They all add up to send a, uh, a child to youth camp. So just remember, if you, if you don't have that much, hey, whatever you can give, we'd appreciate it. Right, Pastor Mike? All right. That's all the announcements. So, uh, oh, okay. Uh, May 5th is the annual men's cake auction. So if you're willing to make a cake, see Ann back here in the back here. Raise your hand, Deb. There she is. All right, and we'll get it started. Thank you. And they have uh, chili hot dogs that night usually. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, if we could ask one of our ushers to pray over the offering this morning.
Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, your silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. darkness tremble just you can do it Lord and we worship you this morning we give you honor and glory you are the only one you are the worthy one and we give you honor this morning Lord oh Jesus 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 Oh, something about that name, Jesus, Jesus. Let's sing that again. Praise the Lord. Just worship Him.
Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance, fragrance after the rain. Take a moment to, to just worship him in your own way. Oh, Heavenly Father. Jesus. Jesus. Nothing else needs to be said. <laughs> Nothing else needs to be proclaimed but the name of Jesus. At that name, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess you are Lord there is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved but that name Jesus all creation knows that name the demons of hell know it and fear it the child of God knows it the world may curse it but everybody knows that name and everybody will bow before that name. They can do it now or they can do it later, later, but they will bow before that name and proclaim all creation that Jesus is Lord. And kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Bless you. Bless you, Lord. Amen. Amen.
Let's honor the Lord with his, with his presence today. Thank you, Father. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, praise team. Praise the Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. And when the Holy Spirit shows up for you, that's a cool thing. When the Holy Spirit shows up for you with a special message, that means that uh, we're a beloved people. That God cares about this church and he cares about you. And when the Holy Spirit shows up, specifically, he wants you and I to prepare to get ready to be alert and to be used for the sake of the kingdom. So never take anything lightly when the Holy Spirit shows up. Never get uh, comfortable. Never, never get just used to familiar with God and the things of God. Let God and the things of God always be special because he is special and they are special. If you would turn in the word to Matthew, <coughs> I'm going to read a few verses out of uh, chapter 18. And actually, the Lord just kind of gave me the title of the message before he even gave me the text for the message. Um, but I'm going to read just a few verses and kind of explain where, where we're going today. Did you come to receive something from the Lord? Is, is the joy of the Lord your strength today? I mean, let's just allow the whole, listen, we, we're not motivated by how we feel. We're motivated by what's real, amen? And so you just know that God's got a plan and a purpose for us today, and he's chosen you to speak into your lives Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, the Bible says, About that time the disciples came to Jesus and they asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and he put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you'll never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as, as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> and anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. And I'm going to stop right there. And I want to say just to encourage you, and this is what the Lord spoke to me, this, uh, where Jesus says anyone who becomes humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And my thought was this, could I ever be that? Could I ever be that? You know, just because you've made a mistake in your life, just because you've made a mistake doesn't make you a mistake. I just think, you know, in this world, uh, we got things like American Idol, and they'll say, well, wh why are you here? Well, I want to be the greatest. I, wanna, I want to be the American Idol. America's got talent. What do you want to be? Now, the only thing about America's got talent is very few from America there trying to win the prize it's the world's got talent i guess but they'll say i i'm i'm going after being the greatest we have athletes that won't be the greatest of all time they want to be that there's people that want to be the wealthiest there's people that want to be the most famous and then there's people like us we just want to be able to get up in the morning <laughs> amen i mean you know we just want to have uh, have a job to go to a roof over our heads uh, and sometimes while the world may aim too high for the wrong things, we aim too low for the wrong reasons. But as I read this, I was challenged. And, and, and I'm, I'm just telling you, the Lord put that, can I ever be that? And so he wants you to know today there's things you can be that maybe you think are out of reach, but you've got to change your notion on things. Because you can be stuck in what if. You can be stuck in watching everybody else be used and, and, and go on and do things for the kingdom and just so busy being a spectator that you don't you're not allow yourself to be a part of the process. But if Jesus says, if you will do these things, you can be the greatest in the kingdom of God too. I just want to see what that feels like. I just want to try it a little bit. 
I want to see if, if that will move me further, if it will make me better. When, when I was challenged with this, it's like the Holy Spirit said, we're, you know, my church is just settling. And we're just uh, kind of okay with the routine and we're okay with feeling okay. But I want you to feel great. I want you to be great. I mean, you and I, we're, we're believers and, and the things like the cliche scriptures, the joy of the Lord is our strength and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We speak those, but do we live those things? We're not great because of what we speak. We're great because of what we are and what we live and what we do. So this was the message put in my heart today. Could you and I ever be that? And actually, the, the word they use in the Greek for child here isn't gender specific. It isn't boy or girl. It's just kid. It's a child. It's like when you speak to a baby, what is it? Oh, isn't it cute? Isn't it? And so if I could, if I could picture this scene when Jesus called a little child because little girls had less status in, in that day just because of the, the importance of carrying the name and different things. I would guess knowing Jesus as I feel like I do, he probably went and grabbed a little girl and brought her and he was saying, you know, the least of the children is this little girl because of a status situation, but I don't know, you got to be like her. You've got to have that kind of a heart. You've got to have that kind of a willingness that she didn't know me, but when I went and grabbed her by the hand, she followed me. And maybe she sat in my lap. You know, children affect us in funny ways. I mean, we turn into fruitcakes around cute little babies. We start talking funny. We start talking like aliens. We don't even know what we're saying, why we're saying it. We spend money. They preoccupy us. We show strangers their pictures. We tell people about them that we don't even know. There's something about children that changes us. There's something about children that gets some good stuff out of us that, where we let down our guard. And I know God has used me as a little child to get things out of people. I remember when I was about 10, Dad was in Vietnam, and we lived with Granny and Granddaddy. And back then, we didn't have pee paws, paw paws, pop pops. It was granddaddy or grandpa, and it was grandma or granny. That's what you called them. So granddaddy would get up in the morning, go to the porch. He would get up and eat breakfast, go to the porch and sleep. He would get up and go to lunch and go back to the porch and sleep. Now, sometimes we would play checkers, and we played with bottle caps. And he taught me about blowing a, a, a bottle cap because if you had a chance to jump and you didn't, they could get your bottle cap, blow on it, and take your... He just taught me all kinds of deep intellectual things that I'm able to share with you. <laughs> One day I walked by Grandpa. I'm 10 years old. I walked by Grandpa. His head's laid back. He's snoring. And I think to myself... I wonder what grandpa would do or granddaddy would do if I poured ice water on his forehead. So I went, I got a glass of ice water. I didn't fill it up, about that full of ice water. And I poured it on granddaddy's head. Well, I found out something about granddaddy I did not know. He could run. <laughs> Granddad could run. I had never seen him run. He come out of that chair, he chased me, he took off his belt. The only thing that saved me was Grandpa's pants falling down. That is absolutely, he's running around the house, and he had to stop to pull up his pants. But I thought, man, I did something awesome. Nobody knew Granddad could run. It was pretty much eat and sleep, eat and sleep. I got Granddad to run. So I'm just telling you, there are things that kids can do. And so Jesus is saying there, there's a child likeness that if you will pick up on that, you can do. There's things that will change you. There's things that, 
will get my attention if, because this is what the kingdom of God is like. Sometimes we're preoccupied with the wrong things. Some get frustrated uh, with me that I don't talk about the blood moons and the red heifers and the, the eclipse that's going on. And, but can I tell you something? Man, I just want to know Jesus and I just want to be ready when he comes and I just want to make it to heaven. That's really all I care about. I can't, nothing can change me that's going on out here. I know it's coming. The Holy Spirit spoke to us a while ago about the times and there is an urgency. We, we know that he is coming. And what the, what the Holy Spirit verbally spoke to us, most of us feel in our hearts and our spirits. That was just confirmation for what we already feel. A lot of times when the Spirit comes and speaks, it's not always a new thing. It's a reaffirming thing that we need to pay attention to. So that's my life. That's my heart. I want, I want to be ready. I want to do what I can to get us ready. I mean, on, on the way to picking up the grandbabies to come to church today, and the, I'm thinking about it, pray for my wife, Pam. You had not seen her. She's got both knees going out. She's got to have one knee replacement. We're trying to take care of this estate stuff. She's had to step down from her job. And, uh, I mean, we're, and we're trying, to get, trying to muddle through to get all this stuff taken care of. We've had an estate sale, a moving sale, and a yard sale. We call it different things. It's the same stuff. But I mean, it is like it's consuming our life. So, but anyway, pray for her. She can't, I mean, she can't get out of bed. I mean, she cannot, she cannot hardly function. Uh, we're going next week and, and uh, they're going to set a time to do the surgery. So just be in prayer. Um, she misses you all. She loves you all. You know, I'm, I miss having her around, but we're just, we're hit with so many things right now. But God's faithful. God doesn't fail. I preach that message. He's, he's not failing us. He's blessing us in spite of these things. But I want to be in the kingdom of God. And not, but but if, if I can be great in the kingdom of God, if that's something that the Lord says I can be and we should attain to be, it's is just be in the kingdom of God, but do something special in the kingdom of God, for God, in the kingdom of God. Could I ever be that? So I'm going to deal with that question today, could I ever be that? Because some of you just wonder if you can just ever be a good Christian. Could I ever be that? Could I ever be loved, the one that my family looks to and loves, could I be that? Could I, could I be the one that uh, God could use to lead somebody to the cross, to salvation? Could I be that? Could, could I be the manager of the place that I work? Could I be that? Could I be a manager? Would people respect me and look up? Could, could I, I be happy in my marriage? Could I be happy in my life? Could I just, could I just be happy? Can I be that? So it's probably a question we've all asked to some degree or another. Can I ever be that? And, and many of you had parents like mine that said, you can do anything that you set your mind to do. You're a smart kid. You're a sharp kid. You can do what you set your mind to, and you can be successful. And then part of us is hearing that, and the other part is saying, I don't know. Can I ever be that? But I think if you and I attain to be great in relationship with the Lord, great in the kingdom of God, I think other things will fall into place. But let me share these things with you today. What does it take to be childlike like that? Like Jesus is talking about. First of all, it takes being fed. If you're taking notes, write that out. It takes being fed. Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 35, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger or never be hungry again. When I was a kid, one of the main staples of my life, and some of you kids probably never heard of this, we had light bread. We didn't have uh, cinnamon raisin swirl, keto bread, sourdough bread, funky bread. We just had light bread. You know, I never see my grandkids just go eat bread. I mean, I had my own special way of eating bread. If we, if we wanted a snack, we went and got bread. How many of you remember that? And you'd hold it up, 
and you start right in the middle. Remember that? Just eat the guts out of the bread. Sometimes the crust would be left, but I don't know if you remember bread balls, getting the bread and like, yeah, balling it up, man, that's cool. Kids don't understand bread. Kids don't know how to have fun. They don't know what outside looks like. I, I know that we, uh, we never sat down at a meal that we didn't have bread. My dad, I mean, he was a little country boy, poor country boy, but and it, it actually upset him if there wasn't a loaf of bread. It wasn't baked bread, fancy bread, just a boom loaf of bread. And if he didn't see bread at the table, like, well, where's the bread? Who forgot the bread? Well, Dad, you got two hands and two feet, but I'll get it. Well, we had to have bread. Bread carried significance. All through life, bread has carried significance. Somehow today it's diminished a little bit. Uh, it's been replaced by potato chips and other things. But there's a reason that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Understand there's a reason that that he went to the bread. You know, it wasn't, I'm, I'm not the a little Debbie of life. I'm not the Krispy Kreme of life. I am the bread of life. And so we've, you and I have got to be fed. We've got to be fed the right way. A child fed right will grow right, amen? A believer that's fed right will grow right. Man spoils everything, even food. What man puts in food and bread will kill you. You'll have effects later in life. They call them preservatives. They don't preserve life. They kill you. I don't know why they're preservatives. But there are people suffering today because of what man has done to put in food and to mess up food. Man always messes things up. Man's trying to, to mess with God's natural order of things. God mess, or man messes God's word up and messes God's plan for us up. What was God created natural, man makes unnatural. So to have your best life, you've got to eat the bread of life. Bad food equals bad mood. I mean, how many of you can just uh, understand eating and being full but still being hungry? Have you ever eaten and you got full but you were still hungry. It still did not satisfy you. And you can go and eat something till you get full, but still want something else. The world is wanting something else, but they can't be satisfied until they get the bread. They're putting stuff ahead of the bread. You gotta have the bread. You gotta have the bread of life. Nothing satisfies. It takes being fed, and it takes being fed by the right thing the right way. It's the same with spiritual food. Jesus will settle your system. Children must be fed, but they've got to be fed right. I mean, how have you ever gotten sick on food? Having food poisoning will make you promise God things. It's not fun. The thing that can heal you can also kill you. What are we feeding ourselves? We're all eating something. We're all eating, partaking of something. We're all being fed. But the, Bible, the first key is this. To, it takes being fed to, to being able to be that. One of the first keys, if you're taking notes, one of the first keys to greatness is the Bible says in verse 3, unless you turn from your sin and become like a little child, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. There's got to be repentance. And one of the first things that we have to do is we have to become helpless like a little child, know that we are in need of a Savior. That passage up here is taken out of John 6, 35, where he said, I'm the bread of life. There's a lot that's going on in John chapter 6. There's a, like a journey that's taken place, a six-mile journey from one town to another town. 
There's a couple of miracles that are performed here, and there's a couple of lessons that are learned here. I don't want to take a lot of time. I've got to touch on these things. There are two great miracles that take place here. One is the fish and the loaves. We all know that. Even the little kids understand when they know that story. Multiplied and food supplied. The miracle was that there, it was multiplied. The lesson was food supplied and how to do that because Jesus asked his disciples, we need to feed them. Where do we get the food? It's a lesson, trying to help them understand the, how could they could be a part of the solution and a part of the process. They learned that you can be full and still hungry, and we talked about that, not satisfied. And then the, the second miracle was the one that they were afloat in a boat, and Jesus comes out and he rescues them. But the lesson was, too, that when Jesus leads you from one point to another, have you ever been spirit-led, ever felt like the Lord was leading you to another place, that it's not always easy. There's storms in between. There's, there can be problems. It's always not easy. The lesson is that you really have to depend upon the Lord. You have to have a faith. You have to have a right attitude in Christ. But just because God sends you on a mission doesn't mean it's going to be easy. So... He, he said, I'm the bread, I'm, I'm what will sustain you, I'm what will get you there. So Jesus walks on the water, he's walking, he's talking, he's walking on the water, he's talking to nature. Encountering storms, when you encounter storms, you encounter God if you're a child of God. God sends storms, not just so you can encounter a storm, but so that you can encounter him and another lesson here is you can't hide on the other side because they, they got to the other side. The Bible says the disciples begin to desert him. Sometimes God gets us to the other side of something, gets us where we're leading us, and we don't know what to do when we get there. How I many of you prayed for something, God answered the prayer that you didn't know what to do with it? It wasn't exactly what you thought it would be. It isn't how you envision it. Oh, Lord, if you'll let me pastor that church, I'll be so thankful. That's the only thing I want to do is let me pastor that church. You can get there. Good Lord, where have you put me? Why did not you warn me, Lord? So there's things we, we want. There's things we just think we want. So you have to understand that, that you can't hide on the other side. When God brings you through something, it's to do something. And so he's the bread. He's the sustenance for you. You've got to eat and partake of him. If you do that, you won't be disappointed. This, you won't ever be hungry. It stands for a lot of things. You won't be lost. You won't be left. You won't be disappointed. You won't be dissatisfied. You won't be sad. But many did desert him, but also... As some deserted, others were converted. That's the thing. You get over there, either you and I will desert or we'll convert and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to, man, I'm going to be this greatest thing, this greatest servant, this greatest in obedience, this greatest in the kingdom of God. I'm going to buy into that. I'm going to do that. And so in chapter 6, verse 31, bread becomes an issue. Watch you, if you read that, read chapter 6 sometime of Matthew. Man, that, it's, it's really not about the storm, it's not about the, the, the ministry on the mountainside as much as it is the bread. Everything through here, he's talking about bread. Bread's such an important part. It takes being fed. Jesus knew that it takes being fed the bread. And the disciples even come to Jesus in there, and I won't take a lot of time with this, but the disciples come to Jesus and, and they said, well, even our fathers had manna. Our fathers, they're saying, Lord, you're not supplying all our needs. You're not helping us. Even our fathers in the Old Testament, when God was delivering them out of Egypt, they had manna. And Jesus' response is pretty much, I'm not Moses. God used him to give you manna. I'm the bread of life sent from God. I'm what you need to be chewing on. I'm what you need to be focused on. That manna spoiled. I don't spoil. That, that manna had conditions. I don't have conditions as far as eternity. So you need to look at the right thing. You need to eat the right. We've got to be fed. We've got to continue. We, we can starve. We can be a believer, come to church, be in a ministry, and still be spiritually starved to death. You've got to be fed. Pastors that just preach and don't pray and study and and do devotions for themselves. They starve. There's, there's pulpits filled with starving pastors. There's marriages that look good on the outside, but they're starving for relationship because they're not feeding what's important. 
There's kids that are in a big family and kids and brothers and sisters all around and grandparents and they feel so alone because they're not being fed attention and love in Jesus. Do we want to be the greatest? Do we want God to use us in a great way? Can we ever be that? We've got to be fed. There's a couple of things here and we need to understand. David said this, taste and see that the Lord is good. Just try Jesus. Have you ever been to uh, like Costco and Sam's Food Club? How many of you will admit along with me, just go for the samples? Come on. <laughs> go around lunchtime. And, you know, if they got a lot set up, you can actually make two passes. And if you're there with your family, you can send your wife, and you can go back and send, like, your oldest grandkid. You just find ways to work the system. But there's samples. There's a sampling of the things that are good that we just taste of, and then the plan is, okay, if you taste it, now go buy it. Because they'll always say, did you like that? Well, here's a hole. They do Vanna White. Here's a hole. And sometimes we do buy it. Usually not. Usually we're too full to think about food. But David said, if you will sample Jesus, if you will taste the Lord, you've tried everything else, but if you'll be fed on something real and something pure and something that stays with you. Uh, my parents had, a, the old timers had an expression uh, take some of that, eat that, it'll stick to your ribs. Jesus sticks to your ribs. He don't cook your ribs. I'm, he don't, don't do no barbecue sauce with Jesus. But he will stick with you. He will fill you. And not only that, he'll refill you. Here's some things to write down. Whether you're out of reach in the boat whether you're out of reach or on the beach. There's four principles in this story about feeding the multitude and the disciples on the stormy sea that you need to know. There's, there's four things that Jesus says real, real quickly. Jesus was these four things. He'll be these four things to you, whether you're on the beach or whether you're out of reach. Write them down. He's presence, he's peace, he's power, and he's purpose. Probably one of the most important things I just said is he's purpose. Without a purpose, you and I will never feel fulfilled. Without a purpose, without a goal, we'll never measure up, we'll never reach our potential if we don't feel what we're doing has an end goal that counts, that means something. So on that beach that day, out in the, the storm, the tumult that day, Jesus was presence. He was such powerful presence that he could not hide. Jesus had trouble hiding from the people. They followed him he, because of his presence. In the storm and in that time when it was mealtime and everybody was hungry and fretting about what to do, Jesus was peace. And when the storm needed to be stopped, he was power. When the demon needed to be cast out, he was power. And through it all, he was purpose. He was making disciples. He was creating those that would be great in the kingdom of God and great in purpose and great in ministry as he's doing with Cross Connection today. Can I ever be that? Can I ever be that? The second thing is this. It takes being led. You've got to be fed, but you've got to be led. Who likes to be led? Nobody likes to be led. Not this generation, not you, not I. We'd rather tell people what to do than be told what to do. It's a hard thing. The scripture says in Psalms 23, 3, he leads me in all paths of righteousness for his name's sake and he restores my soul. Children weren't perfect nor innocent, but it takes being led. Your kids have got to be led. They're not your best friend. They're your child. They don't tell you what to do. You tell them what to do. They don't punish you. You punish them. You deal with them. You give them boundaries. 
You make them accountable. You discipline them. If you don't, you're shirking your duty before God. We have a responsibility. Kids can't raise themselves. That's why this generation is such a mess. The world's one of the reasons it's such a mess. Kids have raised themselves. You see what that looks like. Don't respect anything. Don't, won't take responsibility. And there's exceptions to this. And again, this isn't just teenagers. The generation goes to about 40 or 50 years. So it's a, it's a lot of people. I'm not picking on my kids. I love my kids over there. I'm thankful for you kids. Tell your parents to raise your allowance. <laughs> but we have a generation that's easily led into error. They're arrogant. They're proud. They're flesh-driven. If you aren't spiritually led and fed, you end up dead. Come on. Amen. More ways than one. Only God can lead us to being that. Sometimes we just quit from fear of failure or miss our chance to ever be that. Remember, Jesus said you could be that. He said that you could, you could do that. There's a lot in Scripture that, that struggle with the same things that we struggle with. The outcomes were not always good. Cain killed Abel because he looked at Abel and he said, I could never be that. I could never be that. Ishmael hated Isaac because he looked at Isaac and his connection with Abraham and who he was and Sarah and said, I could never be that. I, I could never be Jacob. Esau resented Jacob. Leah wanted to be like Rachel. She looked and said, I can never be loved like Leah. I wish I could be, uh, but Leah said, I could never be loved like Rachel. I just wish that when he, my husband looked at me, that he would look at me the way he looks at her. I, I wish that somehow I could be that, be acceptable in his eyes. And Saul looked at David and said, even though I'm king, I could never be loved by the people like that. I could never have that anointing. I can never be that. Joseph's brothers looked at Joseph and said, we'll never be the coat of many color brothers in our father's eyes. We can never be like that. We can never be loved like Joseph. But Jesus said you could be that. He said you could be that. You don't have to be Joseph. You don't have to be Jacob. You don't have to be David. You can be that. Don't let the enemy take that away from you. You don't have to follow those that are out ahead, those that are getting the attention today, you don't have to attain to be like them. You have to attain to be like Jesus. That's who we have to follow. Jesus said that you can be great in the kingdom of God. What it takes that these lack the second key. The first key was helplessness that leads to repentance. The second key, write this down. What Jesus said in verse 4 if you want to be that in the kingdom of heaven, anyone who humbles themselves. The disciples were all wanting to be great. They weren't humble. He says, if you, anyone that humbles. We live in a prideful generation, a proud generation, a stubborn generation. But anyone that humbles themselves. The Bible says that we all like sheep have gone astray. I want you to see yourself as a sheep today. For just a few minutes, I want you to think in terms of sheep and that's not all that bad if you if, if you'll just try it i think you can understand what i'm what the point i'm trying to make we all like sheep have gone astray we need a shepherd to lead us if we want greatness in the kingdom of god let me give you some truths about sheep that aren't so pleasant sheep get stuck in routines a sheep will get stuck on the same path, they're creatures of habit. They'll get struck on the, stuck on the same path till that path becomes a rut, and then they get stuck in the rut, and they break their legs. And some of us in our life, we are so set on our way of thinking, our way of going, the way of doing that our path that once was easy and the Lord led us in has become a rut because we're not willing to change. Let God redirect your paths. That's in Scripture. How many of you believe that sometimes God redirects your path? But if you are stuck in a rut, how do you get out of the rut and into the path? Some of us are in paths. Some of us are in ruts. If you understand ruts and you've ever been in one, raise your hand along with Pastor Joy. Let me see who's out there. It's time to get on a path where God's leading you, a path 
to greener pastures. The Bible says he, he, he may want to take you. This was, this was good, that miracle, that blessing, that ministry, that time, that season was good. But now he's wanting to take you to a greener pasture. You have done ate up all the resources. Which kind of leads me to the next, next thing here. You get stuck in ruts. Second thing is sheep will graze for days in the same place. And unless you move, there will be no growth due to no nutrition. You have eaten up all the resources. That miracle was great, but can I tell you, you can't keep living on yesterday's miracle today. You can't keep living on that, that ministry success where you led somebody to the Lord 10 years ago and keep talking about that or when God healed grandma that was an awesome thing but God wants to save today God wants to save tomorrow God wants to heal grandma today but we can't just get stuck in the, the pasture of the field we're comfortable with and I'm talking mentally emotionally spiritually now you just can't get stuck in that spiritual place because after a while you're going to eat up all the nutrition Pretty soon, you have to quit going on all you know and, and, uh, and learn what else God's got for you. I mean, what you know, how many of you have ever been in a job and um, a, a situation where you have to be retrained every now and then? You've got to learn new stuff. The computers change, used to change every five years. Now it's like every five weeks. The program's changing and I mean, we, listen, the world is going at warp speed. I'm just telling you. Things were so much slower. I mean, we have gone from eating holes in bread to where we're at today. So I don't know. You know, I, I know we're in a situation where you've got to listen to the Lord because like sheep, if these sheep weren't led to a fresh pasture, they would have died. A fresh pasture and a fresh pasture. Amen? Okay, we'll move on from that. The third thing is this. Listen to this. They turn grassland into wasteland because they pollute where they're at. You know, if you and I aren't careful, we turn grassland into wasteland because after a while, when we get stuck, we just... Frustration comes, and when frustration comes, we get negative about things, we get critical. And sheep, if they're not moved, they'll kind of pollute where they're at. If you and I get stuck in a bad notion, a bad frame of mind, a bad negative situation, have you ever worked in a toxic environment at work and it just kept polluting itself because you never got the pollution out? How many of you know families can be toxic? That's terrible, but... You can be in a family that somebody need to get out. I mean, somebody needs to take a vacation in New Zealand for about four years. They just need a different pasture because they're polluting everything. I mean, some people just hang out in church just to pollute the church, to control, and not release control. They just hang on. Is anybody listening to me today? Anybody listening to me? So it takes being led. Somebody say amen, and I'll move on after this. I was just joking. Uh, I got one more thing. Take some notes here, and then I'll hit my last point. Four ways to get ahead by being led. Four ways to get ahead by being led. Real simple. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. You can go back and read it. I'm just going to give you the high points. First of all, if you need to learn how to be led, okay, spiritually, and listen, we can, we can, just like kids, we can be that with God. We can be stubborn and question God and we want to negotiate with God. Just obey God. It works out better the first time. Listen, the first thing, four ways to get ahead by being led. The first thing you have to do according to Proverbs 3 is trust him. Trust him. Trust in the Lord. That's the first thing that uh, Solomon says here. Trust. And he learned. Trust in the Lord. The second thing is don't trust in you. 
I mean, the, the actual scripture, tr trust in the Lord, don't lean to your own understanding. But in other words, trust in the Lord. Don't trust in you. Don't trust in you. Don't let your decision, what you think is best, override what the scripture says or what God says is best. So trust in the Lord. Don't trust in you. The third thing is this, always acknowledge God. Do not buy a vehicle without you acknowledge God. Don't go on a date with somebody without you acknowledge God. Don't make a ministry decision without you acknowledge God. Acknowledge that he is God. Let him be Lord of your life. We like the idea of making him Lord of our life. Can I tell you this? Saying a sinner's prayer doesn't always necessarily make him Lord of your life. Making him Lord of your life is a process. Just like getting married. Once you get married, that doesn't make your relationship perfect. Guys, you got to learn that the wife's the boss. She's the authority. Takes a little while. So we have to learn how to cooperate with the Spirit of the Lord. Once we get saved, the Bible says, work out your own salvation. He's not saying work out the, the method of salvation through the blood of Jesus. He's saying you've got to work out your relationship with the Lord. Because there may be some things I require from you that I don't require from somebody else. So we can't say, well, God, they get to do it. That's true, they may, because you're not them and they're not you. But God has a plan for you, and his plan is not their plan. So we can't piggyback on somebody else's relationship with God. Be new in you. Come on, somebody. Let God lead you and work through you. And the final thing is follow his direction. Follow his direction. Who likes to be directed? This world, we do not like to follow directions. I can't even follow directions and put together a shelf because I can do it a lot quicker with a lot less boards and screws than what the directions say. So there you go. And who cares if it's like two inches off? Big deal. I mean, big deal. You just stick some cardboard over one side, and there you go. It's, it, you find a way. But follow his direction. Something we don't like because the Bible says he will direct your paths. That's the problem. We want to direct our own paths, everybody else's path. Let, let God direct your paths. And the final thing is this. It takes seeing red. It takes seeing red. It takes being fed. It takes being led. If you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, you've got to see red. The Bible says, Exodus 12, 13, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Only when I see the blood will that change your situation. Only when I see the blood will that make things right. Only when you see the blood will I be able to do that and be that? It's got to be through the blood. <coughs> this is talking about the Passover. Jesus celebrated it. The Jews celebrate it. The church celebrates. When we see the fruit of the vine passed around, usually on a Sunday morning, we see the blood. In Luke 22, the disciples argued that who would be the greatest in the kingdom? Who would sit in a place of honor after Jesus' miracles, calling out the Pharisees, Peter declaring him Lord, Jesus predicting his own death and the transfiguration? You would think the disciples would be troubled for Jesus. They saw getting ahead, not red. They just saw how they could get ahead. But the disciples were more troubled about their positioning in the kingdom. They were more troubled about where they, would, where they would sit. But when they saw that crown of thorns, when they saw that beard being plucked, when they saw what the cat of nine tails did, when they saw nails in his hands and his feet, they saw red and they saw Jesus finally. When they saw the blood, they saw the Son of God. When they saw the blood, they understood that it wasn't about their position. It was about his position. And to be great, it wasn't about sitting in a chair. It was about carrying a cross. They didn't have to hang on the cross. Some did. Some hung upside down. Two or three of the disciples did. We might, may not ever have to hang on a cross, but you and I will always have to carry a cross. We'll always have to carry it. Before we carry it we've got to be willing to pick it up you can't be great in the kingdom till you're willing to pick it up some just they say things and they go through rituals they just leave the cross laying there but when we get to the place where we'll 
be Christ-like in the sense that we'll carry it and let the world see the scars of ministry, the change in our heart, because you can't see Jesus without the blood. Families, moms, dads, kids, there can't be a relationship with Jesus without the blood. We, we, we have to live his sacrifice, knowing about the blood, the blood and being covered by the blood. There's two different things. The disciples had heard about the blood, but they weren't covered by the blood yet. The world has heard about the blood, but the world's not covered by the blood. There are people claiming to be Christians. They're in church. They can talk about the blood, but they're not covered by the blood. When, you, when you're covered by the blood, church, you can't help but see the blood. You can't help but see red when it covers you. They knew about and had observed the Passover from the prophets of old to the church of today. The blood, they have to they see the blood in order to see Jesus. Our children, the world, this generation must see red to know he's not dead. You got to see red in order to know that he's not dead. The third key here is holiness. Holly, if you would come and begin to play as I close out. The third key is holiness. Verse 7 says, what sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin. So we have these three things. We have helplessness. It's a childlike faith for forgiveness. We have humbleness. We have holiness that will allow us to be that for the kingdom of God. And I'm going to close out for this and, and write these things down. I think they're important. Could I ever be that? I hope today that you have confidence to know in Christ. The Bible says that you can do all things in, in Christ. The Bible says you're not just a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror. We can all we do all things through Jesus. So understand because of Scripture, you can, you can be that. You can be that fully, totally, wholly committed to him, used in a powerful way by him. Could I ever be that? <coughs> Let me give you three first steps. I mean, you know, baby, got to take some first steps. Skin some knees and get some bumps on the head. And so some of us are to a place, we just need to learn the basics of gaining confidence that could I ever be that? You, you can be whatever you want to be in Christ. You can be the fullness of what he's called you to be. And that's a problem. A lot of the church, a lot of us in ministry, we're just halfway, three quarters of the way to what we can be in Jesus. I believe that when God created Adam and Eve, I believe their brain totally functioned. I believe they just knew how to do things that weren't even explained to them. We see that a little bit now through savants or some part of their brain. Only 10% of our brain works. So there's some people that, in my case, 2%, but there are some people that a, a part of that other 90% comes alive. Nobody knows why. But at two years old, they can play a piano. At six years old, they can tell you a date that happened 200 years ago. That's the brain of Adam and Eve. That's the fullness. That's what we don't have because of sin. But I'm telling you this, one day, one day, we're going to be all that. We're going to have all that. And that's going to be awesome. The only bad thing is my wife already knows what I'm thinking. I've got to work through that. That's her gift. Guys, your wife has a part of the brain that works that yours doesn't. When it comes to arguing and remembering, just forget about it. That part of their brain works. You think about the good stuff after the argument. Not during the We're thinking about fishing or golfing or college football game. They're thinking about what you did two months ago that, that needs to be dealt with. Come on, somebody. Could I ever be that? Here's some first steps. First of all, repentance. Write that down, just a first step. Ask forgiveness from God. The second thing is resilience. You didn't think I was going to say that, did you? But I'm telling you, a first step to being, to, to being able to do all that and be all that 
Resilience. Bounce back with God. Ask forgiveness from God. Resilience. Bounce back with God. Listen, I'm bouncing back at least once a week. I am bouncing back from a setback. We got to bounce back. People in relationships and trouble and problems and their spiritual walk, everybody stumbles and falters. And, but the, the key is not to focus on, on, on falling back, the, the focus on bouncing back. Come on. See yourself as a basketball. When you leave here, I want you to you look in the mirror. Don't see you. See a basketball. That will be a lot more appealing to some of us. See a, a basketball that bounces back. Basketballs are tough. You bounce them, you throw them, you kick them. They're hitting the rim. They're getting stuck in the rim. They're getting needles stuck in them to pump them up. What a terrible life a basketball has. But the cool thing is they may need pumping up, but they always bounce back. Come on, somebody. So resilience. Don't be defeated and get down and lose out. Bounce back. Come on back. If you had an argument with your husband or wife, bounce back and love each other again. Overcome it. And then the final thing is reliance. Repentance, ask forgiveness for God. Reliance, bounce back with God. Resilience, bounce back with God. Reliance, depend on God. Depend on God for everything. Stand with me this morning. And listen, if you need Jesus today, just come on up and let us pray with you. If you need Jesus, come on. If you don't know him, come on. Let us pray with you. But church, I just wonder how many of us are thinking no matter what that is in Christ and again let me see your hands if you ever thought could I ever be that let me see your hand could I ever be that Jesus said you could and boy I gave you a road map I gave you a road map if you'll just be faithful to do those things Pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, and if you need to come to this altar, you come. If you're really stuck in this, you come to the altar. We'll agree with you. But Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, God, you see the hearts out there. There are some because of their physicality, the things that they could never do that or be that. There are some because of their past, the things they could never be that or do that. There are some, Heavenly Father, that are where they're at mentally and emotionally. Don't feel that they could ever be that. Father, there are some that have struggles in their life. They have trouble overcoming. They feel condemnation and guilt, and they just think in their heart that they could just never be that. I want them to know, Lord, that all things are possible according to your word in Christ Jesus. All things are possible. Lord, we are not I can ever be that people. We are an all things are possible people. And I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name that their, their attitude will change. They'll start worried about how they feel, God, and what they can, their limitations physically, but they will do what they can, and you'll water that and take that and let that grow and be powerful for the kingdom, and they can be great in the kingdom. And Father, for those that are so insecure in themselves, God, they, they can't even hardly speak, God. I pray in Jesus' name you'd give them a holy boldness. Lord, that let, give them confidence, not in who they are, but who they are in you. A God that can do all things. A God that can speak to wind and waves and evil spirits. A God that, who, whose name everybody knows. The name that they serve. They can do all things and anything. God, I pray for spiritual confidence in them. Not arrogant pride, but spiritual confidence, God, that they can be everything you've called them to be. And they can even be a lot of what they want to be because God says he'll give us the desires of our heart. Now, Lord, I know sometimes that means that you'll give us what we desire, but also you'll give us what we want sometime, God, if it's within the framework of your word. So I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would let us go out of here confident and bold today, knowing, Heavenly Father, that we don't have to worry about could we ever be that. Just go out of here looking forward to becoming that. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Elizabeth, we need to pray with you. You, 
Some of you ladies, if you just come and agree. It's, it's a mental battle. The enemy's warring with her mind and making her think she can't be all that. But she can. Let's just extend a, a hand forward, everybody, that, that Satan would, that God would cast down every imagination that's not of him. And put a seal, a covering over her mind. Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, we just pray, God, that for the power of righteousness. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would cast down every stronghold, take every thought captivity. And Elizabeth, the Bible says that you have the power in Jesus' name to take every thought captive and cast that down. And you can walk in new life and in freedom and peace and in power. And you don't have to accept what the enemy says. The Bible says he's a liar. Believe what Jesus says, that he has set you free in Jesus' name. God, we pray just, Lord, for the power of deliverance, God. Lord, I just pray for an awesome anointing to come on Elizabeth. I pray, God, for the power of a free mind to hear you and serve you. I come against the lies of the enemy. He's a defeated foe. The only power Satan has is a lie. The only power Satan has is deception. But Father, in you we have peace, we have authority. We have, God, what they had that day on the beach. Father, we have your presence. We have your peace. We have your power and we have your purpose. And Heavenly Father, Elizabeth has all of those today. Presence, peace, power, and purpose. And we release her into that. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, we bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless the Lord, oh, my soul. We bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Mike, would you close out in a word of prayer as we're dismissed today? And y'all stay in the altar and pray as long as you want. Mike, go ahead and dismiss us.